Welcome back, everyone. First, I want to say too, before we start with our 10 o'clock session, is that um, if you find any and all of this interesting, we'd love to have you join our PNCWA Leadership Committee, as well as any other committee with PNCWA. So great opportunities to network and to learn. Um, so we'd love to have you. Just a little plug for that. So what I'll do now is introduce our next two speakers. So Nicole Laughlin, West Regional Marketing Director for Brown and Caldwell, and Natalie Sierra, Professional Engineer for Brown and Caldwell. Their session is titled, Capturing the Power of Diversity, Reflections from an Employee Networking Group Centered Around the Advancement of Women. Take it away, Nicole and Natalie. Thanks, Karen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Sierra with Brown and Caldwell, and I'm joined by Nicole today. And we're going to talk to you about how um, we work to create the first employee networking group at BC. Next slide, please. Um, and Nicole and I are, are not diversity and inclusion specialists. That's not why we took this on. Um, we really were motivated by our, our personal lived experiences in this industry to, to start this effort off. For me, um, I've, I've been in the industry about 20 years, and when I started, I really felt like the sky was the limit, all the hard battles had been fought, and there was nothing that was going to stop my career path. And I really found that that wasn't true for women in our industry, and have been really motivated as I reached this stage of my career to try and knock down some of those barriers for other women coming up. And Nicole, do you want to say a few words about, about why you wanted to be a co-lead? Yeah, hi, thanks, Natalie. Uh, so in addition to managing a team of entirely women um, at my role at Brown and Caldwell, uh, for the majority of my childhood, um, I was actually the daughter of a single mother. Um, she actually had three daughters while also trying to balance raising her children while advancing her career in a male dominated industry. And as I reflect on her experience now, I'm often left a bit disappointed with how much she had to sacrifice personally in order to get ahead professionally. And so, you know, when I had this opportunity, my, my goal was if I could even have a small positive impact on the world for women like her, um, I'm gonna be proud of what we've accomplished. So thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. And as we go to the next slide, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what ENGs are. Um, ENG stands for Employee Networking Group. They're sometimes also called ERGs, Employee Resource Group. And if you go to the next slide, um, they're really just a tool and a toolkit for diversity and inclusion. If they're the only thing you're doing to support diversity and inclusion, they're just wallpaper. But as a piece of an overall effort, they can be really powerful. And the reason for that is that they're, they're bottom up. So they're employee run and self-sustaining by the energy and the community within your workplace. Um, and they can really help foster new connections and networking and be a safe space for sharing or exchanging ideas. So helping people feel that sense of belonging that's so important to um, inclusion efforts. And go to the next slide, please. So with that underway, I'm just going to go quickly through our agenda. Um, Nicole's going to, I'm going to hand the baton to Nicole. She's going to talk about why you might want to create an ENG. And we're going to be talking from our perspective as the, the women at BC ENG, but obviously there are a, a bunch of other groups, and we'll talk about that later um, to whom this might apply. I'm gonna come back and talk about what our specific journey has been, and then Nicole's gonna wrap us up with our lessons learned and some practical tips for getting started. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Nicole. Thanks, Natalie. So uh, as the question on the slide states, you may be curious if you have a reason to create an ENG. And if your goals include retaining top talent, um, improving team dynamics, an operating high performing organization, you probably have a reason to create an ENG. Uh, you can go to the head to the next slide. Um, and let's start, oh, sorry, one more slide. <laughs> so let's start with the question, why do we need to retain and grow women? The research shows that having a diverse, well-balanced workforce has numerous benefits. Diversity enables innovative thought. Uh, women's communication skills tend to um, lead to better team understanding and alignment. And recent studies have shown that women in leadership positions tend to make more informed business decisions 
which can help improve financial performance and profitability. But more than anything else, uh, and as simply stated on this next slide, it's the right thing to do. Uh, creating pathways for women to grow into leadership positions is not only good for our industry and organizations, it's the morally and societally responsible thing to do. So we're gonna pause on this next slide and ask the question, why isn't it happening? Um, and go ahead to the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, simply saying improving inclusion matters to you won't be enough. Progress requires us to acknowledge the realities of the modern working woman, empathize with that experience, create better working conditions for them, and make space for women to grow in their careers. Uh, this graphic, if you click to the next slide, uh, is from leanin.org. And when you first look at it, it may come across as a little overwhelming or confusing, but the big takeaway is to see how the gray boxes, which represent men, increase in size as people move up the corporate ladder. When you realize what you're looking at, it's easy to see that the pipeline for women's professional progression is narrow. And while we are making progress year over year, this, this figure clearly shows that women are either hitting a glass ceiling or leaving their careers at some point. Um, click to the next slide. Uh, this particular challenge has been exacerbated by COVID-19. It is estimated that as high as one in four women will decrease their working hours or leave the labor force as a result of this crisis. Women are reporting much higher levels of burnout as a result from longer working hours and more demands at home. And this article by Corn Ferry does a really great job of articulating this problem in a really compelling way. Uh, the subheadline states, experts fear a total wipeout of years of gender progress. Go ahead. Um, so what can we do? This, uh, you can go ahead and click to the next slide. Uh, this can all seem really overwhelming and you might wonder where can you even start? ENGs provide a forum for us to work on answering that exact question. Next slide. Uh, ENGs are a tool for change. Uh, sure, they're a forum for discussion and networking, but the real magic happens when we talk about the outcomes of an ENG. ENGs are enabling policy changes, helping managers better understand their employees and preventing employee turnover. So with framing up that why, I'm gonna let Natalie share our particular experience founding and facilitating the Women at BC ENG. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so let's move ahead and talk about what our journey has been. This was the first ENG we had set up at Brown and Caldwell. So Nicole and I were in uncharted waters. And if we move to the next slide, um, we started out by, by establishing our mission. And our mission was to have um, a shared passion and interest for building up and empowering women in engineering, leadership, and career growth to positively impact not just Brown and Caldwell, but our industry and our communities. So pretty, pretty lofty, but but we were game. We really, I think our membership feels pretty passionately about trying not to just, um, just empower change within our immediate circles. Um, and if we move to the next slide, I'll talk, I'm going to talk about kind of the three phases in our evolution to date. The ENG has been in existence for about three and a half years. So we've moved through a couple of different shifts over that time. And as you might imagine, the first stage was really just getting everybody on the same page, um, really understanding what the major issues and barriers are to women rising. And as we go to the next slide, um, when Nicole and I were kicking things off, we issued a survey and we've actually done this every year since. And the survey was meant to get at what do people want to talk about as well as um, reflections on our corporate culture and some other, just providing a feedback mechanism as well. And for the women in the audience, um, I'm showing the top 10 responses from our survey at the time. Probably not a whole lot of surprises here, work-life balance, um, figuring out how to grow your career, how to overcome the gender gap and um, navigate gender discrimination. It was a lot. Um, so as we go to the next slide, we talked in the early discussions, really again, creating this common language. What does work-life balance really mean? Or should it just be work-life harmony? Um, what do, 
what can a mentor do for you and not do for you? Um, we brought in our women leaders to talk about their career paths. And it's in this last one where we started to talk about institutional bias that Nicole and I really felt like we were hitting a wall. We could tell that there were things that people wanted to talk about and we weren't talking about them. So I issued a blog post encouraging people to tell us, you know, what are we missing? What are we not talking about? And, and before I get to that, and I'm sure some of you can, can imagine, um, I wanna talk a little bit about how kind of the behind the curtain, some of the things we were setting up for this phase. So move to the next slide, please. Um, the, the previous speaker hinted at this as well. And, and I'm the kind of person who feels like if there's something difficult, you really need to lean into it. And if you lean into it with, with positive intent, um, you can get some really beautiful results. So I call this second phase mining the difficult pile because there were a lot of challenges we took on that felt really scary, um, but I believe that we got beautiful gems as a result of, of digging into those issues. So next slide, please. Um, but before we got started in, in that job of mining the difficult pile, there were a couple of things we needed to be successful. The first was group norms for how we behave. This was something that um, we drew our inspiration from our Pride Alliance ENG. These are setting ground rules, things like the ENG is a safe space. You can't use things people say in this um, forum against them. Um, the, another one of our group norms, just to give you some examples, is assume positive intent. When you're having really challenging discussions, people are not always going to say things the way you hope they do. Um, Nicole and I included. And so you have to assume that they're there to really work on change. The second thing that was really important, all our ENGs have an executive level sponsor. And that's important for a number of reasons, one of which is to give us as the co-leads guidance, as well as to bubble up the issues and discussions that are coming up in these forums. Um, and that was really critical. The third is all our ENGs have an HR liaison. Um, when you're dealing with issues like sexual harassment, you're starting to trigger um, legal requirements, company policy issues. And so we really needed um, an HR staff person to help us navigate those, those issues. Um, things like not being able to promise confidentiality in all situations. Um, next slide, please. So what, was, what were some items in the difficult pile? Um, as I hinted at, sexual harassment was, was really the, the foremost one. And it was in particular harassment occurring outside of our individual office spaces. So those gray areas, things like conferences or client dinners. Um, also the ways that implicit bias can, pay, can play out, things like forced administrative roles and bias and promotions. Um, our membership also really pushed on our HR uh, department, and Nicole's going to talk about it in a little bit, to quantify the pay and leadership gap. And then I'll talk about this concept of psychological safety. If you're not familiar with it, I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Next one, please. So I mentioned we, um, that I, I issued this blog post, asked people to tell us what was on their minds. And I have to say our membership was incredible. They were really blunt and vulnerable, and it really got everybody's attention. Um, so I'm gonna read you some of these quotes now. Um, I've been touched inappro inappropriately at conferences more times than I can count. I told a couple of my peers about the experience, but it was just dismissed saying, oh, he's just an awkward old man. And it's hard not to correlate these experiences to job performance, especially when you're already singled out for differences that you have no control over. Um, these went on and on and they were heartbreaking. And our senior le leadership to their credit allowed the conversation to happen. And I think we're very surprised that this was still going on. Um, so it was very eye-opening, including some people saying, wow, I talked to my spouse and she told me things that I had never heard about before. Um, and I think the bravery and honesty of our membership really helped spur everybody involved um, to fight for change. So as we go to the next slide, I'll talk about our next pivot. Um, as we were navigating this difficult pile, the feedback that Nicole and I were getting was that 
look, change is not going to happen unless the men are at the table. Where are the men? Um, so we've really tried to bring a broader coalition to the table to work through these issues and, and pivot and fight for change. Um, and as we go to the next slide, when we're talking about institutional change, it can feel really, really overwhelming. Something very helpful to us was this concept of locus of control. When you have an internal locus of control, you're trying to make things happen. And there's always something within your internal locus of control. Maybe it's small, it's on an individual level, but if everybody's thinking, what's the thing I can do to affect change today, right now, change happens and it can be pretty incredible. Um, we had feedback from our membership saying our parental leave policy isn't progressive enough. And that got enough steam to change our parental leave policy, just as an, as an example. Another important concept um, on the next slide, if you're not familiar with it, is a concept, the concept of psychological safety. Um, this is covered pretty well in a book called Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson. And it's the idea that everybody, a psychologically safe workplace allows everybody, everybody to bring their whole self to work so they can make con their unique contributions. Um, it also means that you're not getting punished for mistakes or questions. Um, so there are behavioral and structural ways to institute psychological safety in your workplace. Um, and leaders really have to go first. This happens on the team level. You have to show you're, you're fallible, you're, you're capable of making mistakes, and that certain jobs are not necessarily beneath you. So setting up meetings in thoughtful ways, for example, so that note taking is not always being done by the women um, and creating a safe environment for feedback. Another um, resource I wanna, I wanna talk about because we've been digging into this book for about a year on the next slide is this book, um, fabulous book called How Women Rise. And it talks about how some of the habits that help women achieve a certain career level can then really cause them to hit a cement ceiling. Um, and I've highlighted uh, the three that our membership uh, resonated the most with our membership. Things like the disease to please, we just dug into that one about a month ago. The, the idea, this idea that you say yes to everything without really thinking about what it means for your career or what you can meaningfully um, manage. So if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Um, and then, next slide. As we've pivoted, um, towards this opportunities for change, other ENGs have arisen in our workplace. It's inspired others. Our most recent one is our community of color ENG. And the amazing thing about this is um, that we've really been playing off each other and trying to look for opportunities, these intersectional opportunities to work for broader change um, in our, our workplace and our communities at large. Um, overcoming bias, working on mentoring and sponsorship, things like that. And I say that's amazing because if you think about it, um, any of these individual groups maybe represents a sliver of our workplace. But when we work together, we're this powerful force for change. And so um, I just love the idea that we can appreciate the uniqueness of each of these groups, but then bring that diversity together and fight for inclusion. And I'm going to hand it back over to Nicole then to talk about our lessons learned. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Uh, so uh, since we were the first ENG at our company, we didn't have a playbook to get started. Uh, it involved a lot of creativity and a major leap of faith for everyone involved. And we definitely learned a few things along the way. So you can go ahead and click two slides, actually. Um, one of our biggest lessons learned is the fact that we could have benefited from more hands helping to lead and facilitate the ENG. Natalie and I were co-leads for this ENG on top of our day jobs. And while we were so fulfilled from our participation in this group, we were also stretched a little thin. Um, oftentimes we felt like we were dropping the ball or getting caught up in that perfectionist trap that Natalie was just talking about. The Community of Color ENG, which is one of our peer ENGs, did a great job of recruiting a pool of people to share the administration and facilitation of their ENG. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, you also want to set up the ENG with the goal to bring in new co-leads on a somewhat regular basis. We recommend starting with a group of co-leads to establish everything and then get it up and running 
And then about every six months or so have one co-lead rotate out and a new co-lead step in. By having a regular rotation of leadership, you're making space for increased visibility of future leaders, um, enabling relationship building, bringing in fresh ideas and offering valuable on the job skill set. Uh, uh, and the next slide is uh, you wanna think about how you wanna measure progress. This was a common question that came up early on in our ENG. How are we currently doing and how will we know if we're making progress? It's hard to know if we're moving in a positive direction without quantifiable data. So determine what you wanna measure and then look at what the data is telling you. Uh, data is often a lagging indicator of behavior, but by having this data, you have the information needed to inform what goals you wanna set for your organization. Uh, this screenshot is actually a snippet from our publicly available balance and belonging report on our website. And by creating this report, we're committing to keeping track of a number of factors related to diversity inclusion and monitoring our progress year over year. Uh, on this next slide, uh, this is a little bit on the softer side of things, but you should also be prepared for it to be awkward at first. Um, people are going to wanna feel out if this community's intent is sincere and they're going to be afraid to step into the spotlight and share their experiences if they fear retribution from their peers or supervisors. One idea to overcome this is actually to have people in leadership positions step into that spotlight first and share their stories. Um, people will warm up a little faster if they see that leadership is taking the lead and showing some of that vulnerability. Um, no matter what though, it is essential that you allow people the space to say things that are going to be hard to hear. You are going to hear about previous experiences that are gonna make you cringe and you're going to learn about your coworkers' assumptions or insecurities that are gonna break your heart. Um, but as hard as all of that is going to be to hear, you're also gonna see the power that exists within a group of marginalized people when they're able to be heard and valued. So be brave, be uncomfortable, and be supportive. Uh, on the next slide, uh, this, is, this is a really salient point, but you wanna make sure that everybody understands that inclusion is their responsibility. By simply only including women in these conversations, progress would have taken forever. Um, and it would have continued to take forever. Uh, we realized this early on with our ENG and began to readily encourage participation from all of our colleagues. And because of that, change is happening at a much faster pace. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. So uh, to wrap up, for those that are looking to create their own ENG community focused or some other community based group, here are a few tips to get started. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, first, you can do this. I know that the concept of being a perfect representative for your community or being an expert on your community's issues will prevent a lot of people from wanting to get started. It can definitely feel intimidating. Uh, I'm gonna assume Natalie's okay with me saying this, but I don't think either of us consider ourselves model representatives for women, but that wasn't our job as co-leads. Our role was to listen, find passionate people with shared interests, and facilitate a conversation around shared experiences and goals. Uh, on the next slide, when it comes to more of the administration and mechanical side of it, you wanna make sure that you're building um, a resource pool, both of um, you know, books, literature, TED Talks, um, in addition to a group of people that are excited about helping facilitate conversations around certain topics. One important note on this though is just be cautious of shifting topics too quickly if the community wants to dig into something a little deeper because it can show like you're trying to avoid that hard pile. But you know, if you do this legwork, you're, you're usually gonna be prepped with about three to six months of content. Um, and on the next slide, I think this is our most important recommendation is to remember that the ENG is just a tool. Simply having the ENG alone is not enough for change or progress. To advance the mission of an ENG, you have to get your hands dirty. You need to be intentional about your networks. Uh, don't be ashamed or defensive of your blind spots and reflect on your values and live those values. Um, these little changes in your behavior in terms of who you sponsor 
or you know the diversity of your candidate pool, these will all have a major impact over time. And just remember that no community is expecting perfection overnight. They're simply asking for awareness and progress. And finally, um, last point on uh, the next slide is to be open to this experience and have fun. Uh, through my participation uh, with the women at BC ENG, I have learned a lot about myself and built relationships with amazing people in our company. And Natalie is definitely one of those people. Um, these ENGs are an opportunity for marginalized people to feel seen and heard, sometimes for the first time in their careers. So um, my closing point is, you know, if each of us leaves this session today and actively works to advance diversity and inclusion, we're only going to see positive results uh, in our industry and our organizations. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll take any questions now. Thank you, Natalie and Nicole. So with the four minutes that we have left, what for organizations that don't have an established ENG, I mean, this is wonderful. What we asked, you know, Nikki and Rob this too. What are some small wins? How can they get started? You want to start with that, Nicole? Mm. I mean, first and foremost, one of the things we did is, you know, our executive leadership team um, heard from small group breakout and networking sessions that there was a desire for this, right? And so part of that is is raising your hand and saying, this is a this is something that's of interest to me and I think we should be doing that. And then having leadership sponsor it and enable it, right? Um, and then, you know, from there, it, it's a few people just really being able to step in and work through the discomfort um, and kind of figure it out as you go. But I mean, my biggest thing is to say, you know, this is something we're interested in and we're willing to take it on. You wanna to add to that, Natalie? I would just say, um, I can guarantee you that if you have a diverse workforce, there are people who wanna be having these conversations. And you can start out in a more ad hoc way and see what comes of that. I think Nicole hinted at that, that we had some small group sessions that, that were the seed. Um, but it's out there. People, people want this, they want change. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note then, Rob had this question. So what's an ideal composition of classifications, you know, for C-suite, you know, senior management, entry level, et cetera, add an ENG? Well, I think we mentioned they're really employee led. So that's, that's a, a BC requirement as well as like the, co there has to be interest from co-leads. It can't be an executive saying, now we shall have, you know, fill in the blank ENG. So that interest has to come from the community because that's what's going to basically fuel the engine. Otherwise, it's just yet another corporate initiative, right? Mm -hmm. For us, I will, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> for us, there's a single corporate sponsor, but other, um, other of those C-suite members participate and, and engage in the blogs and in the, in the talks and, and things like that. So the composition was really open to whoever was enthusiastic and wanted to participate, I think, as far as that goes. Nicole, what did you want to say? Um, it's just to make sure that leadership is listening, though, right? Um, in some sort of, you know, be, be it just listening to the conversations or being curious about where the conversations are heading. Just make sure that they're attuned to what the community is saying. Yeah, that's great. Well, that is all the time we have. I can't thank you enough, Natalie and Nicole. And again, we'll see you um, at 1130 in the breakout rooms. So I appreciate that. So before we head into the break here at 1030, I just wanted to remind folks, make sure you tweet at PNCWA org. Um, also make sure that participation is great. Um, we need it for CEUs for those of you who are applying. So what we'll do now is take a 15 minute break and we'll see you all back for our panel at 1045.